We are here today to have an open and honest dialogue about the current shaky state of the Baltimore Ravens. We talk about the Steve Saunders drama, talk about Rashad Bateman calling out Eric DaCosta, what John Harbour and Eric DaCosta had to say at the 2023 Scouting Combine, and so much more coming up next year on Locked on Ravens. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another episode of Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostriker of Ravens Wire. We are here, as always, on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for tuning in, being here with us on this Friday, making us your first listen each and every day. We're free and available anywhere you get your podcasts, all podcasting platforms, including over in video form on YouTube. So be sure to like and subscribe on YouTube, follow along in audio form. As well, and boy, do we have a doozy here today to talk about this Baltimore Ravens team. Here to dive into everything that's been going on with this team is former Baltimore Ravens wide receiver and a Super Bowl champion, Kadri Ismael. And Q, this is going to be you know an open and an honest dialogue about the honestly the shaky state that this team is in right now. There was plenty that came out yesterday in terms of Rashad Bateman calling out Eric DaCosta for comments, Steve Saunders, that thing has blown up it's now a huge talking point huge point of contention we're gonna dive into everything here today and I want to start off just with where you think this team is at right now there's been a lot put out obviously the NFLPA survey I liked what they did I liked the survey I think it provides the players a platform to give you know obviously an anonymous assessment of how they really feel like things are going within the organization for the Ravens, there was some good, I mean, you know, travel locker room, but the glaring points, I know the family grade surprised a lot of people. And obviously the strength staff with an F minus, I mean, you F an F minus isn't even a real grade. Like the, the lowest you can get is an F on something. The Ravens got an F minus. And look, I know, I know the commanders, they had their fair share of F minuses, the Cardinals, but you don't normally loop in the Ravens with those types of organizations. You don't. And, and that's the, the thing that uh, I know we're going to talk about as far as obviously with Steve Saunders. But I think by and large, the organization, the way in which you run things, uh, is it an upstairs versus downstairs? So the upstairs back in the day before you had the castle and all these other beautiful updated facilities, you had pretty much your upstairs administrative general manager, money people. And then downstairs, you had the players and the players locker room and the equipment staff and the trainers. And that was about it. And so, yeah, with the upstairs, downstairs mentality, um, some organizations like the Cincinnati Bengals of, of yesteryear, like the New York Jets, like uh, the, 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 the Cleveland Browns. Um, yeah, you get like a, a kind of a, a picture of. Who does what? I, I really uh, wish they had that back when I was an active player, but um, it is. It's very surprising. Other than the F minus, the F minus didn't surprise me. And yeah, that is a real great brother. You can't just all of a sudden brush over it. There is some major systemic issues that are at play here. And that's something where you got to give it a minus, minus, minus. When we get graded as players, you would have that plus grade. That plus grade was, eh, okay, he did his job plus, or check. I, you know, there was it was like the the plus and a check. But if you got like a check plus, that basically meant that yeah, okay, you're doing something. Like if it's a if 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 my job on that play called for me to cut off the backside safety, and I went in there and I sifted him out. Well, I not only hit him, but I knocked him on his butt. As football goes. You just never know. And all of a sudden, if a guy now he's cutting back and because you knocked that guy on his butt a split second more, your running back gets maybe, I don't know, eight extra yards and or an even bigger play. So now you're looking at 25 yard gain because of your backside responsibility. You're going to get that check plus on your grade if, in fact, you do what not many guys really would want to have is that loaf. And what I mean by loaf, 
I in one day recognized I will never do this again. So I'm at Syracuse and my coach, you know, he's grading all of us. He goes, guys, you know, Dennis Goldman, I love him. He was in my wedding the whole nine yards back in the day. And literally he was like, guys, we're never going to do this again. So he circled the laser and had 45. And I was like, well, I miss Smile. I'm 45. Like, what, what are we doing here? And so next thing you know, homeboy was like, you loafed. And in my mind, I was like, yeah, I kind of did. But I thought that, you know, I could take that play because it really, I'm not even in the primary guy. Well, when you're the primary guy and you're loafing, or if you're a loafer as far as a backside guy, whatever it might be, you get a minus minus. And you collect enough of those suckers, go ahead and try to negotiate a contract and talk about whether or not you're going to be on the team or whatever. Coach going to call you out. So that F minus, that's a real grade. And I love the fact that they got, they, the Ravens strength coaches got called out for being so poor. And that's something that needed to be addressed and should have been addressed. But some of the other issues that you talked about kind of surprised me, kind of surprised me in a sense, as far as family wise, because you are talking about a coach that prides himself on, Hey, bring your family in and, and all that. When I used to do a ton of TV and radio at the castle. Literally, I'll never forget. I'm bringing in my kids and it was late night. I had a late night uh, radio gig and and I'm like, all right, cool guy. Hey guys, listen, you know, we, we gotta be, you can't be running around. You can't be, you know, we, we, we gotta come up in here. So Clay, Kyrie, and Kadir like, all right, you know, we're going to do this. Well, right coming around the corner, here comes John Harbaugh. And I don't know, maybe he was like in year two, year three. So he looks over and he goes, oh, hey, who are these guys? I was like, oh, hey, coach, you know, <laughs> you know, this is my uh, daughter, Calais, Kyrie, Kadir. Oh, hey, guys. Well, you guys are happy to be here with your dad. They're like, they're kind of like, you know, shaking their head like, yeah. And it's like, oh, man, you know, the best part about this, we got a big field. You guys, you know, you guys be able to run. I was like, oh, okay. So they were just like in heaven. Man, they jetted down the hallway, knew exactly where to go, got their special gum. Every facility's equipment, people have these big old packs of gum, blah, blah, blah. My kids loved it, bam. They thought they were the man. Well, because of John Harbaugh and his attitude towards having family there and very inviting. So I don't know what went on and why, but it's interesting that that grade was as low as it was. Yeah, and I know, you know, your F minus, you know, it's, it's crazy to me. A A plus, A minus, B plus, you know, go all the way down. But then it's F. The Ravens, they they below, like somehow below an F or an F minus. And I know, Q, a lot of people, myself included, thinks that the Saunders era probably should have ended a couple years ago when, you know, allegedly Saunders had the COVID symptoms. He went into the facility, was, you know, the guy that started the whole outbreak. And no, the Ravens kept him on. The should have ended, but go ahead. It, no, I and it's something where... I think urgency is is the word I keep coming back to where, look, the Ravens are an organization that, that's they're loyal, right? They, they trust their guys. They believe in their guys. But when change or when action is needed, change or action is needed. And something needs to happen there. We can even talk about Greg Roman, where probably something should have happened last offseason. I, I understand why they kept him on because of how many injuries. I'm talking about injuries. It all, it all ties into one with, with the strength staff and Steve Saunders. But, you know, there there was an argument to be made there. But it just feels like to me, Q, the, the urgency for some of these moves, it, it's just not there right now with this team. The, the, the thing that I think it, it's there, but it's with blinders. And I think the, the hard assessment when you go down to the principal's office is really shocking because I thought that, you know, part of – what they would do, they meaning Steve Bashadi and, and talking about leave no stone unturned type of a thing, you know, assess what the year looked like and why and, and all those details that go into being a successful organization. And 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 it, it it just seems like they, for whatever reason, put blinders on. Um, yeah, no, it, it's OK. Yeah, everything's cool. Um, yeah, well, you know, we'll, we'll chalk it up to this. Oh, OK, cool. Yeah. And not really realize that um, the one guy they got rid of 
from their equipment staff because why? Well, he was being a jerkosaurus to everybody. And, you know, after a while, people were like, no, nah, you, you got to go. But it took him like insulting some of the people upstairs to get the, everybody else's attention. Like, nah, he, he's been like this. Y'all just hadn't seen it or y'all choose not to do anything about it. So it's a lot of that. It's a lot of put your head in the sand. And so when you look at, yeah, <laughs> this, this, uh, this flow of, of a uh, survey, you, you get, you get some hardcore truth. Yeah. And I, you know, I've seen, it's very rare. I've seen this stuff over the past couple of days with the survey, but some people are saying, well, you know, this isn't like, it's not the real perception of the organization. And I'm like, no, this is what the players think. Like this is a, this was a survey about the players and how they feel about things. So it's not like, for example, you know, the Cardinals, their owner talked about how the facilities weren't an issue and, you know, their facilities are fine and those reports aren't real. Then the players come out, they get like the lowest facility grade and saying, you know, the floorboards are coming up in the weight room. And I'm like, these are real things that are happening with all these organizations so you know some teams graded out really well and had a pluses and, and b's and stuff the ravens had some of those a's but i think the more glaring issues and the things that are sticking out is the f minus of course because of, of a guy who a lot of people already had issues with for the past couple of seasons and we're going to get into more of that in the second segment with steve saunders talking a bit about how the Ravens can fix this, how they can move on from Steve Saunders and maybe get their strength program back up to par. So be sure to stay tuned. So lots to dive into on Locked on Ravens. But first, this episode is brought to you by Built Bar. And if you're looking for a delicious treat with all the fat and calories, then you have to try your Built Bar. And I know we just got through the holidays a couple months ago. And me, my goal is to eat a little healthier this year. And if you're like me or you want to eat a little healthier but don't want to compromise taste, then I've got just the thing for you in Built with Built. It is healthy and actually very tasty. They're so delicious. You won't even think they're good for you because they do taste that good. And what makes Bilt Bar so good is for starters, they're covered in 100% real chocolate and they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and coconut almond. And they only have 130 calories and four grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein. And I don't even need to wait around to get a box for you. I've been talking about ordering your Bilt Bars at Bilt.com, but now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. That's right. Heads your nearest Walmart today. Walk to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of Bilt Bars. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs. And if you're close to a Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box with hip flavors, such as brownie batter and churro. Get your hands on a Bilt Bar. You can thank me later. We're back here, our second segment of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Ostrick is still here with Kadri Ismail as we sort through everything that's going on, continuing our, again, open and honest dialogue about the state of this team, which I know right now Q feels a little shaky based off of everything that's come out. And the Steve Saunders situation has been the one that's gotten everybody's attention. And there have been multiple, obviously. We haven't even talked about Rashad Bateman. We haven't even talked about Lamar Jackson. We'll get to that coming up. But I want to continue our conversation about Steve Saunders because – the, the grade came out, the, the daunted F minus. But then after we now see multiple, and I mean multiple former players come out and say, you know, this ruined my career. Or I had these injuries or the strength staff didn't help this, that, and the other. So on top of the grade, you're now getting real life stories from these former players. I mean, Quincy Adebayo and Carl Davis and Bam Bradley and, you know, Matthew Judon has been outspoken about it before. Obviously, Derek Wolf. you know, we're bringing back Derek Wolf into the conversation. He's talked about it as well. What, what does this mean to you? And I, mean, and I mean, how serious is this deal? Because now there are multiple things compounding on each other. So when you look at this sport, it's a collision game you recognize that you need to be in a certain level of shape. When you also look at the recovery element of it all, some guys recover faster than others. And some guys, as you will have heard throughout the decades, man, I am so glad so-and-so was <clears throat> in the locker room because he was a veteran player. And he taught me how to be a professional. I know, me personally, not only was I that young guy that sought out professionalism from other players. How do you do this? How do you do that? Questions that you would have. And then when it comes to taking care of your body, man, I told guys how to take care of their body because guys told me how to take care of my body. So... 
one of the things now that I do currently is talk to people how to take care of their body from ages six all the way up to my oldest client is 84 years old. A lot of respect for me because of the fact that I help him and some of my older clients move better. Now, all that being said, when you look at what the state of the league is all about and why we look at the F minus from a lot of the players and the kickback of comments of like, yeah, uh uh-huh, we've been trying to say it. You could see where, again, I am so mega talented, but I also want to improve my craft and improving my craft. I need people who are mega talented in their respective field to help me. Unfortunately, what happens is you get people who put their head in the sand And they just do basic traditional movement that is detrimental to guys, detrimental to their bodies. But because they're high functioning athletes, they are great compensators. They have the ability to compensate and overcome said weaknesses. Now, that's where the frustration comes in. Because you're asking me to do something and you're putting me in a position to compromise my own movement. And now, like, I'm being in collision all the time. Why do you think the NFLPA collectively bargained for, like, the the pads not to be as intense? And now you have limited padded practices throughout the year because the collisions add up. And now you don't have as many veteran guys. Well, who's that benefit? The benefit's the owner in a sense because now he doesn't have to pay that mega contract to the veteran, but also it ultimately hurts the owner because why? The product isn't going to be as good when said star player who is a professional, learned how to be a professional, learned how to slow the game down, he get hurt because you had too many rough and tumble practices in the offseason, and then it carried over into the season. So you have all these rules in place. But when it comes to strength and conditioning, yeah, that's a problem. And it clearly, from an F-minus standpoint with the Ravens, it's a huge problem that needed to be and still probably needs to be addressed. I, I completely agree. And, you know, it, it wasn't just, you know, the, the F-minus is, is the most glaring grade out of all that just you know, part of it because it's an F minus but then you have the weight room which was a C plus that was tied for 22nd in the league you know uh, mentioning a lack of space lack of quality equipment in the training room as well you know players feel there could be more equipment and resources the training room was ranked to C. that was 21st and now you have the Ravens bringing in obviously Saunders is now gone you know that that is now out of the question, but the Ravens hire someone internally. And we've talked a lot about internal versus external hires for offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator and the Ravens, you know, staying true to some of their values and and some of their principles. So with someone coming in queue who has been with the organization for a couple of seasons, do you see things changing within the organization in terms of their practices and what they can do? So as far as that, you know, when you have a guy that is internal, um, he kind of already knows the system. He knows he's been in those meetings, whether or not he's had a lot of say or not a lot of say, but he's going to kind of figure out, you know, how to survive. I mean, the NFL, from a player's perspective, owners, not owners, excuse me, owners, only one who doesn't have to worry about it, unless I guess you're Daniel Snyder. But, you know, from a general manager aspect of thing, from heck, team president, Uh, the head of marketing. Um, What am I trying to say? No one is untouchable. Like you best do your job. And bottom line is the bottom line. How can you earn us money? Okay. If you can't earn us money, if you can't improve the product on the field, then we need to get rid of you. And so when it comes to how do you improve and you got the same guy that was the same guy who F minus you to begin with his underling. That to me is a concern because now is it he going to learn the ropes and be like, well, you know, I can say this or I can say that. And it, 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 it's like a critical thing. So, so here's what I mean by a critical thing. So off season wise, say if we're doing, Hey, we, we need to be hitting the ground running. We got, we had a lot of hamstring issues. Okay. So we need to do more sprinting. 
Well, I know from a conditioning aspect of things, sure, you know, the more you are able to sprint and run and all that, it's going to build up a level of motor unit endurance. But I also know that if you train with your feet like this, as opposed to your feet like this with a half dome arch and sloping to the outside and really having an understanding of how to move. But if you train like this in the weight room and you train with your heels as your priority down, that carries over onto the playing surface when you are doing those moves in the off season. So when the season comes, you setting guys up for ACL, MCL, PCL, shin splints, lower back pain, sore hamstrings, all that. And if it doesn't get addressed, then basically you just repeat it, but you just paint it over the color of the name card. When you're talking about what changes need to be made, the bottom line is a strength and conditioning coach has to have the understanding on how to help his players move better, not baby them, but for certain, not overly train them to wear them down to the point where their bodies won't be able to sustain the rigors of the sport itself. Right. And I think 2021 was eye opening for a lot of people where look, it, it just happened over and over. I mean, the injuries, the big ones were before the year with, with JK Dobbins and Gus Edwards and Marcus Peters and those injuries. Non-contact, was just... non-contact. That's what's scary when they're non-contact. And that has to do with a lot of you programming your motor units and that motor unit being programmed wrong. Yeah. And, and then, it wasn't like it just kind of stopped for, with that. It was a continuous issue throughout the entire season, obviously compounded by Lamar's ankle injury and everything that's kind of spiraled ever since those, you know, first couple of practices before the season started, you know, the Ravens had guys out b- before the year. And, you know, besides that, it was Rashad Bateman who also had the hernia during the off season during the first couple of days of training camp. And, you know, LJ Fort tore his ACL. I think people forget that as well. LJ Fort tore his ACL in the second preseason game against Carolina. So it's all these things coming back. And now with the Ravens, they have to move forward, I think, with at least a somewhat different plan. But again, with the Ravens hiring internally, we will see if it's just, again, more of the same with just a different face or if it's different. strength and conditioning community, Unfortunately, they are stuck in a position where they feel bigger, bigger, bigger. And the way in which we get bigger is literally by traditionally moving the hips in a reverse movement pattern with the heels locked in the ground. Then you are expecting that person to move forward, which is the reverse of backwards. And when you have your heels locked in the ground, you're setting the person up for a risk of a serious injury. That is it. If you don't change that and you think that whether you hire internally or externally, some raw, raw muscle headed dude who thinks because you got some metric on to tell you how fast a guy runs miles per hour and his heart rate goes up and down, that that somehow is cutting edge. That's a bunch of hooey. You gotta figure out the biomechanics of it all. You can't just do it half-hearted. You gotta know what you're doing. Half of these strength and conditioning coaches, they don't even know because they never did it. All they know is about biceps and triceps. They know body parts. They don't know the systemic element of how your body operates and how it moves correctly. And and I think at the end of the day, the, the whole thing here, and you talked about it, Q, was getting these players, getting these guys in, in the positions to maximize their bodies and putting them at the least amount of risk possible. You're right. Football is a collision sport. There is risk every time you go out there on the field. The, the job of these strength and conditioning coaches is to minimize that risk as much as possible and put these players in the position where they can go out there at their best and perform on Sundays or Mondays or Thursdays or whatever, perform on the field when there's an opportunity and not have them out for extended periods of time, not have setbacks or put them in positions where they're going to be overworked by the time the season starts. So hopefully things happen this offseason for the Ravens where they can, they hopefully can get their strength program back on track, but somehow key we're, we're not done talking about the state of the Ravens. We still have plenty to talk about in the final segment, Rashad Bateman calling out Eric DaCosta. We have more Lamar Jackson talk as always. So be sure to stay tuned. So last as I've been to on the show.
we return our final segment of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Allstriker still talking with Kadri Ismael and Q. We'll move away from from Steve Saunders in, in the strength staff. There is more to talk about. More, more I mean, big I can keep things. Going if you want me to. I'm, no, I'm, no, I know. <laughs> there, we could talk about it for hours, honestly, because there's yeah. there's so many intricacies of what happens there. But I do want to get to Rashad Bateman because I think this was a pretty big storyline where obviously Eric DaCosta and John Harbaugh both talked to the media at the Combine on Wednesday. And Eric DaCosta was asked about the wide receivers and you know the problems of drafting wide receivers. And I'll, I'll read the quote. He says, if I had an answer, that would probably mean I would have some better receivers. We're going to keep swinging. There have been some guys that have been successful players for us that were draft picks. We've never really hit on that all pro type of guy, which is disappointing, but it's not for a lack of effort. It's one of those anomalies that I really can't explain other to say that we're not going to stop trying. We're going to keep swinging. And hopefully at one of these points, we're going to hit the ball out of the park. And then you have Rashad Bateman coming in on Thursday morning and saying, Quote tweeting the, the the quote and saying, how about you play to your player's strengths and stop pointing the finger at us and eight. Blame the one you let do this. We take heat 24-7 and keep us healthy. Care about us and see what happens. Ain't no promises, though. Tired of y'all lying and capping on players for no reason, to which Marquise Brown actually, you know, someone quote tweeted the, the Rashad Bateman tweet. And Marquise Brown said, let him cook. So... There, there are all these problems stemming. Obviously, it's I think it's a very tense, shaky situation for the Ravens right now. I mean, what what are your thoughts on this, Q? Do you think this is a big deal? I'm looking at those comments, and I think this, that if you look at Eric DaCosta's full uh, interview, because he went over to our colleague, my dear friend, uh, Sarah Gellison, or Ellison, rather, um, her Twitter was transcribing um, the comments of Eric Costa, and it looks as though like Rashad looked at that only because in Eric's defense, in a sense, he literally was saying the progress of Rashad Bateman before he made those other comments. And he was saying how, he feels like he's itching to get back out there. He was talking about him in a favorable way that led me to believe, okay, cool. You know, he's, he's, he's liking the progress. If he's liking the progress, uh, him and, you know, bait are on the same page and okay. At the same time, I can also see where bait is probably feeling frustrated because of the transcribing, it does look like, you know, wait a minute, you're taking a shot at us as a as a unit. But dang, like, to be honest, we didn't really get that much love and burn. Like, again, as you and I talked about, good golly, like, you know, week four and five. How in the Rip Van Winkle you going to forget about Devin Duvernay? You got to put underline and asterisk by his name and all the other stuff with the now departed Greg Roman. We talked about all that receivers. I know, <laughs> I know because I know, but but I'm saying what I mean by, I know is, is that you don't just go into a game and like, feel like, well, maybe I'll get a ball. Maybe No, nah, You're like, yo, bro, I'm about to do this. Especially if it's not a strong uh, defensive back unit. You're like, man, okay. Some of our concepts are going to be working. Let's do this. Case in point, we played against Tennessee uh, Titans and we played them 2001 with Elvis Gerback, and we were on film. Deron Jenkins, literally, like, we, he was a former Raven. We knew he had trouble covering the deep ball. Ryan Billick comes up there. He's like, guys, I'm telling you right now, we're going to throw it deep. We're going to take our shots. And we know Deron Jenkins, we're going to find him, locate him on the field. We're going to throw at him. Well, it was like a ha-ha funny thing because – Literally, right before the night before the game, his name came up again. And one of the other guys' name was like Corey Harris. Corey was like, man, bro, y'all just hate on, on uh, Duran. Like, man, he was our dude. But at the same time, sure enough, yeah, 989 was called. And all of a sudden, I was like, yeah. I was I had Duran as my assignment. Sure enough, bro, I blah, ran right by him. It was one of, I think it was my longest touchdown of my Raven career might've been tied for the longest, whatever, 77 yarder, but that's game planning. That's aggressiveness. That's receivers like, yo, I'm about to do this. And 
you got plays that you know that are my plays. That's why I think, you know, the Todd Munkin hire, you saw all those dudes like, oh, buddy, you about to have some fun now. <clears throat> when I look at what Bate is trying to say, I think there's like this feeling of like, man, you know, you're not really using us the way we felt we could have been used. And then it just it just keeps snowballing. And that's where I think it's not just him, because obviously, you know, Eric hyped him. But it's like the whole flow of it. Now, there's also your part that you got to do as far as knowing your assignments. And then if your number is called, you got to produce. But by and large, it's it's both sides. It's not just the players. And I think that was where he's like, yo, it's not just us. It's not. But I think that's where um, Rashad was coming from. Yeah. And, you know, I think that Bateman is also frustrated. You know, he was a, he was a very healthy college player. He hasn't had a full opportunity to go out there and I think show the world, show the Ravens what he is capable of in, in a full potential aspect. So hopefully for the Ravens, they'll they'll be able to, you know, well, for Bateman and Acosta, I'm sure they'll they'll talk it over and, and whatnot. But it, it is might something. have already talked it over because yeah. he deleted the tweet. But uh, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. Obviously, he was saying he was he was texting Bates. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe after that, you know, uh, Eric's wife probably jumped up there. Was like, oh my god, you need to find out what happened. And who knows? Or, I mean, obviously, I'm I'm Lacey's awesome. She's wonderful. Clearly, she follows a lot of the players. Clearly, she follows a lot of us on social media and all that. That's not an indictment or nothing negative towards her. I'm just saying that somehow, some way, it clearly must have gotten back to um, EDC, some form or fashion, who knows. But the bottom line is, is that it was taken down. I'm sure they had conversations then uh, once it was put out there. Yeah, so we'll see. I... I... Don't think this spirals. I think, again, you know, it is kind of a big deal. The, the tweet was even put out there in the first place. I think that in itself is a big deal. But I think I think it will get, you know, suppressed. I think things will be fine by the time the season starts, or honestly way before. But also, Q, Lamar Jackson, we got that franchise tag deadline coming up. And obviously the Ravens, you know. With Lamar the Jackson, are we talking about Lamar? We have I know. It's, in the whole it's segment. Like, we haven't talked about him at all. It's it's it's, it's new here, but we're, we're talking now about, obviously, with the franchise tag, the Ravens, DaCosta said, and Harbaugh talked about it too, not entirely sure, you know, franchise tag-wise, what franchise tag it would be if there is one. But to me, Q, this whole situation, and this was going to be the topic of the show before everything happened on Thursday, but it, it just feels like until a, a true resolution is is put forth by both parties whether that's an extension or whether it's a trade it just feels like the Ravens have their hands tied behind their back because there's so much that goes into this in terms of what the Ravens do in free agency what the draft looks like even for the combine which guys they put their effort into evaluating whether they want to look at these star quarterbacks as it was reported by Jordan Schultz I believe it was Ravens meeting with Anthony Richardson would they do that if Lamar had an extension Probably not. So there's just this whole situation of, you know, to me, Q, my question is, is how, how hard are the Ravens hands tied behind their back, I guess, until something gets resolved here? Well, I mean, <laughs> you can't really, you know, go forth with a strong plan salary cap wise until you actually know what you're, you're, you're dealing with, with Lamar. Um, yeah. Do you, you formulate a young team? Or do you feel good about going out there and getting some more veterans? Um, what does it look like for some of these guys that, you know, like a, like a Marcus Peters, you know? I mean, they're talking about how the draft is real deep at corner. Okay, cool. But we also know that Marcus Peters is Marcus Peters. Well, we've got to figure out the numbers. Are, is he going to be willing to wait? I think he is, but, you know, business is business. Um, what about some of the – Office of line uh, situations that you got to look at and, and figure out. Um, Zeitler and, uh, you know, obviously Powers, you know, very well could get into a scenario where, you know, there's a back and forth, more than one team asking for his services. And, and now what do you do as far as, you know, countering that with, you know, going out in free agency and getting your, your replacement for him or in-house or how – there's so many things that are hinging upon, 
you know, getting this done and, and obviously, you know, not just letting it just slide. So uh, it's, it, it's, it's great for us because it's information that, you know, gives us a chance to dialogue and go back and forth. I think, you know, even as, as we look at it from, you know, our fandom aspect of things, um, it can be a little unnerving because you, you, you want them to be able to sign guys and figure it out and all that. But uh, that's a conversation that, you know, EDC is going to have with Lamar. Remember it says, or he said it takes two to tango. It seems like they're talking because that's what he was saying. They're talking to Texan and figuring it out. And it's, it's difficult uh, and challenging and okay. This is, this is where we're at. Yeah, and I'm I'm ready for something to be done. I'm ready for just the situation to be resolved one way or the other here. But Q, do you think that sliding Lamar solves everything for the Ravens? You know, I know the, the saying is winning cures everything. With how shaky things have been over these last couple of days, and honestly, you can argue longer, do you think a Lamar Jackson extension, if he signed, kind of cures this and the negativity, or do you still think even with that extension, there's still work to do? Uh, he's your generationally talented player who's your franchise guy. <laughs> if you get him, now you open up things for the possibilities. What are the possibilities? Well, you're talking about receiver. Now you're talking free agency. Or you at least you know what direction you're going to go in as far as the draft is concerned. And you only got a limited amount of picks. And yeah, <laughs> he's the guy. He's the, he's the reason why, you know. I mean, that's something that I think you you put that into effect and, and all the other dominoes kind of like start to fall. Yeah. And so let, let's wrap everything up. You know, we've talked about Steve Saunders. We've talked about Rashad Bateman and Lamar Jackson and just how shaky things seem right now. I mean, how, how concerned are you with the state of the Ravens right now? Or do you think by the time we're talking in a couple weeks or a couple months, things will be looking a lot better? It'll be looking a lot better. I think, uh, you know, it again surprises me with some of the other grades on their uh, <clears throat> um, report card because they're such a a well known, well run organization. Uh, so that also means okay, mud in our eye, let's fix it. The good organizations they fix it; they don't just sit there and wallow. And I think that's really super important. Um, to, to know that I think that they are aggressive enough to want to fix it. Yeah. And look, I still think the Ravens are a good organization, but I think this does open, I guess, some cans of worms about, well, I don't think any organization is perfect. Like there are, there are issues with any organization in all of sports, regardless of who you're looking at. But I think this gives now the Ravens an opportunity to fix these things. Weight room wise, obviously strength staff wise and, I still, you know, I'm not putting them in the categories like the commanders or the Browns. Like, I don't think that's who they are. But some of these things that were put out here, especially by a survey of players, which means something, it means a lot. I think those are things that have to be resolved. And hopefully this will kind of spark some change to happen within the organization. But Q, I appreciate you hopping on. Thank you so much for doing so and kind of navigating it. So, so much to talk about here. And hopefully next week, We'll get more positive things to talk about with this organization. Again, for agency, it is it is right on the door. It's knocking on the door right now. Yeah, I, I tell you what, this has been a, an interesting start to the offseason. I'm glad that uh, things are being shaken out. If you, you address what's in the dark and you bring it to the light, that's when things start moving for the better. Absolutely. So we have a ton to talk about still a lot to dive into about the course of this offseason, obviously for agency, the draft and so much more here on the show that's all i have you here today on locked on ravens thank you so much for tuning in again be sure to like this video subscribe on youtube follow along in audio form as well for daily ravens content five days per week let me get back here on monday mock draft monday number three coming up so be sure to stay tuned for that and i'll see you right back here on monday